Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on several acres out in the country. Too many. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening, and we want others to love it, too. Yes, we do, and we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, and where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Carol. Hello, Dee. Do you know why I started to laugh at the beginning? I think I do, but go ahead and tell our listeners. You don't have any idea. I thought maybe I would use a real soft NPR kind of voice. Welcome and you to the Garden Angelus. <laughs> Because <laughs> then I didn't know if I could do it. <laughs> then it Welcome becomes to the Garden Angelist. <laughs> <laughs> then it could become one of those skits on SNL. Right. Oh, and it's like, gosh. oh. Anyway. Uh, How's so, your garden? my garden is good. We we actually had a fairly warm week, and I should have been out there doing stuff, and yeah. I didn't go out there and do stuff. But yesterday I went out and took some pictures. You know, we have this, I have Garden Bloggers Bloom Day on my blog on the 15th. And so yeah. even though we're recording this on the 14th and yesterday was the 13th, I went out to look for my hellebore, which would be blooming right now. And it only has buds. But guess what I found, <laughs> Dee? What did you find? Snowdrops in bloom. Oh, and we're going to talk about snowdrops later. Not as our flower, right. but as our book. <laughs> Which is why we chose the books we chose, because I saw hellebore buds and snowdrop flowers in December. Well, that's awesome. At my house, I don't have much of a garden update. We got snow, copious amounts of snow. I'd say a good three to four inches out at my house. And the bulbs indoors are blooming, but I couldn't find a snowdrop outside if I wanted to. And guess what's going to happen tomorrow? Snow or rain? More snow. Because it's only 18 degrees outside this morning. It's going to go up to 30. So tomorrow we are supposed to have an 80% chance of snow. I'm kind of wondering if it's going to be like the year when I turned 16 and learned to drive and it snowed every week on Wednesday. Every week. Really? For the entire winter. It was the most bizarre thing. And I was driving a little car that was not good in the snow. So that's enough about that. Well, we had rain. Rain is good. Saturday night or Friday night into Saturday morning, but it's been warmish. And like right now I'm looking out, I, I just filled all the bird feeders before I started this podcast and there are tons of them out there and the grass is very green. And I think our, our weather's reversed because we should have snow, not you. <laughs> I know it's bizarre. We don't usually get snow until after Christmas in January or February, but this has been a weird year all the way around. So why should this be any different? Do you have a quote for us? I do. Actually, you came up with this quote. I did. You can read it, though. <laughs> Thank you. Blessed is the season which engages the whole world in a conspiracy of love by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Yeah. I keep wanting to say Mabel, but it's Maybe. M-A-B-I-E. Yes. A very old author. I looked him up and mostly to find one more quote by him. So I really don't know much about him except he's British. And I think he wrote children's books. That's all. Um, he did. He did write children's books. I looked him up too, but I've slept since then and don't remember. I just know that I loved that quote and it fits the Advent and Christmas season. It does. And that's why I chose it. And another thing, the thing we're going to talk about also fits the Advent and Christmas season. That's right. We're going to talk about mistletoe. Yes. And mistletoe is the common name for a bunch of different plants. Yes which we were surprised at, that are all kind of in a certain family. So in Oklahoma and Texas and Louisiana, the mistletoe I'm talking about is Phorodendron tomentosum, which is, or it could be Phorodendron leucarpum. And that, that last one is oak mistletoe. And I see a lot of mistletoe in oak trees in the winter in Oklahoma. And so your mistletoe is completely different. Right. In Indiana, almost assuredly, the mistletoe that you're going to find up in the trees this time of year is oak mistletoe, which is the Phorodendron leucarpum. 
And I right. I found out, D, that this is really kind of fun. They're in the sandalwood family, which is called Santa Lacie. Get it? Santa? For, for Santa. How weird. Santa Lacie. That's I've never heard of that family. I had Have neither. You? Nope. But it kind of fits. I like it. I love these little botanical name forays and families that we go and investigate and learn about. I also found out, you've been holding out on me, Dee, that mistletoe (laughs) is the official state emblem of Oklahoma, not the state flower. That's some kind of a rose. So originally, when we chose a state flower, it was mistletoe. And then I think it was in the 60s, um, a, a woman went to the state legislature and said, I don't, it might have been the 50s, I don't know. Anyway, she said, I, we, d- we should not have mistletoe as our state flower. For one thing, as you and I talked about before we started this podcast, you really don't see the flowers on mistletoe. You see mistletoe berries in the winter, right? Right. The other thing is, is mistletoe is a parasite, and no state really wants for its flower to be a parasite. However, I did a bunch of investigating on this a while back, and the reason they originally chose it is that the settlers felt like it was something evergreen in the winter, and Oklahoma is not very green in the winter. Oklahoma is brown, usually, brown and gray. So they saw it as a symbol of hope, right? Right. Like holly. So anyway, now it's the Oklahoma rose. That is our official state flower. It's our floral emblem, whatever that means. And then um, that's mistletoe. And then our state wildflower is gallardia, because we need three. I guess. I don't know about Indiana. I did not look up state emblem or state wildflower for Indiana. I know that our state flower is the peony, which everybody is aghast at because that is obviously not from around here. (laughs) That is from Asia. No, China. Yeah, Asia. Um, One thing I also noted, because we were discussing this this morning about the floral emblem, this is all a political compromise because... Some people wanted Gallardia to be our state flower, which would make sense because it's native. This lady wanted the Oklahoma rose, which, by the way, don't grow it. It's a terrible rose. has terrible disease problems. It's not strong. Beautiful shape, beautiful flower, almost black red, but not a good flower to grow. And then some people wanted to keep mistletoe, so they just created these designations, which is how government often works. But I have this, I collect quilts. And I collect old quilts, especially embroidered and applique quilts. And I have a state flowers quilt. And it's when we only had 48 states. And guess what the floral, the flower is for Oklahoma? Mistletoe. Mistletoe. So that just goes to show that things can change in your state. So all the information about mistletoe and its various designations, I got from the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center's newsletter, And I really appreciate that newsletter. It tells me a lot about our native flora and fauna. And then you found your info. I found some information on the Purdue University Cooperative Extension site. We will link to both of those. And, you know, I got to thinking, Dee, two two things. Number one. Yes. I'm reminded that when people want to harvest mistletoe to bring it inside and hang it in little bunches in the doorway so that everybody that meets under the mistletoe has to kiss. Right. Well, it's way up high in oak trees and apple trees and hawthorns and things. You got to shoot it out with a gun. Yeah, you either have to shoot it out with a shotgun or you have to have somebody shimmy all the way up in that tree. And when I was a kid, people sold it all the time. You found it. But in recent years, there isn't as much of it as there used to be. And I don't know if that's because of pollution. I don't know. I don't I don't see much quote unquote real mistletoe for sale. All you see is that plastic stuff. So the other thing I got to thinking about, D, was so we have these yes. native mistletoes, the forodendron, and I thought, uh-huh. well, what does Europe have? Because the stories about mistletoe predate, you know, America, and they sure. have a completely different genus. Viscum album yes. is their plant. And I assume album means white. Yes. Because alba is white, right? It's singular. I don't know what viscum means, but I suspect theirs probably has bigger berries than ours does, but I don't know if that's It true. could be. It's still that's in the same Santalaceae family, which I'm going to, now that I know about that family, that's kind of fun. 
That is really fun. And we should we should go ahead and explain that parasites are plants that meet their nutritional needs by pap- tapping into the flow of water and minerals of other plants, most often trees. And so that's why some people don't like mistletoe, but it's native and, you know, it just, it lives here. And that's, and I see it uh, because I live out in the woods. I see it up in the tops of the trees. It's really, really high. And you know what? What? I never hear about anybody saying, oh, my tree died from mistletoe. I've never heard that happen either. And I don't think it does because I think they evolved together way, way long ago and they deal with it. Exactly. And the other thing about mistletoe that we should point out to people, yes, if you have the real deal, is it is poisonous. So don't don't eat it. Get it anywhere near your pets. Yeah, don't eat it. Don't let your pets eat it. But and don't you know, berries, don't eat berries. I actually did a garden consult last week and um this woman had young children and the, her young children, her boys were outside and they were picking berries off of Ilex vomitoria. And I told them, no, don't eat those. I said, you guys aren't going to eat those berries, right? And they go, no, we're not going to eat them. I go, good plan. Vomitoria. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The common name is? I don't know. Holly. Oh, yeah. I knew it was a holly, but it's not, it's not anything that grows around here. So I don't have to, I never think about it. You don't grow hollies at your house? We grow hollies, but I don't think that. Ilex vomitorium is hardy here. You don't have yo. I think it's yopon. It's yopon holly, holly and yopon holly is not is not native around here. It's not, not native around there either. It's an import. No, it's not native here. But period. I don't think it's yeah. hardy enough. Um, but it is. Oh, is it not hardy in your part of the world? No. It's so hardy no. here. I always forget that we don't live in the same place. Exactly. Okay. Well, anyway, keep going. I'm ready for the next quote. Don't be afraid of opposition. Remember, a kite rises against, not with, the wind. Hamilton Wright, maybe. That's a good thing to know. Yes. We have certainly had opposition this year. Oh, my gosh. We shouldn't talk about it. (laughs) I have no... uh, We are not going to talk about it. I have no idea why you picked that quote. It is lovely. Did I pick that Uh, quote? I didn't pick that quote. Sometimes I... Sometimes I do the strangest things. Maybe I was thinking about it It was a windy day and I was thinking about kites flying. I don't know. Go ahead and talk about our um, our veggie, which isn't really a veggie. So our veggie is really an herb, and we chose rosemary because rosemary is kind of symbolic of Christmas. You can go out to the stores now and you see lots of little shaped rosemary plants for sale. Have you ever gotten one to grow? Yes. I've never gotten one to grow. Yes. In fact, we talked about this last year, and I did buy one. And mine survived a long time, but I gave it special care. I did various things to make it happy. But there's a good reason it doesn't, they don't do well. So they're usually shaped like little Christmas trees. Right. And they don't do well because they're very not, they don't like the cold at all. And so if you pick a day like where you're at today and you buy a rosemary and you don't (laughs) properly protect it, getting it to the car and getting it home, just that little bit of chill will just like, it's just like revolt. I think they're, they are also really, really um, packed into those. Like they take four little plants and they plant them together and then they start shaping uh-huh. them early. And then they put them in those pots and they're really, really crowded. Think about that because rosemary is a woody herb and a woody herb. If there's four of them in a container, that's like a well, less than a quart. That's, Asking a lot, right? Right. And then in order to keep it from making a mess when you water it, they have it in another container without drainage holes, or they put one of those foil liners around it. And a rosemary right. does not like wet feet one bit. It is a Mediterranean plant, so it likes it on the dry side. It likes it on the dry side. It likes sharp drainage. I grow it very successfully out in my potage. It likes alkaline soil instead of acidic. Basically, it's, you know, it comes from like Greece or somewhere, and they likes those kind of conditions, right? Yes. And I like to go back to the term you said, sharp drainage. Extremely. So here's how I kept mine alive last year. Sharp drainage. We should tell people why we call it sharp drainage as opposed to okay. dull drainage. I love the word sharp drainage. <laughs> okay, dull. you tell them why. I don't know why it's called sharp drainage, but it just means that sucker's got to drain quick and fast. 
I think that's what the emphasis is on, you know, get the water out of here, run it across its roots. So the first thing you should do if you buy one of those little potted guys is you should pull it out of its container and water it really good in your sink without, and when I say container, I'm talking about the little foil container, leave it in its pot and take it out and water it really good. Then if you really want to keep it longer, I'd suggest you repot it in a much bigger pot. Uh, yeah, but not too much bigger because, you know, those guys they are like playing, crowded. They like a little crowded, but you can look at it. And if you see roots pushing the edge, it's time to go up a pot. So just up one size if you want to. And that's what I did last year eventually. I also put it out in my greenhouse periodically to give it a rest from the indoors because we have all that dry heat indoors, which is hard on all plants this time of year. So last week with the warmer weather, it would have been a good week to buy rosemary plants. And I usually get sucked into one because I like the idea of like having little scissors and snipping it and making it that perfect little topiary shape. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really fun. <laughs> but just just keep in mind, you're basically buying cut flowers, even though you aren't buying cut flowers. Yeah, don't don't, don't expect it to last. Don't expect it to last. And if you want to grow rosemary in your garden... I suggest growing it in a container. I think it'll be happier. You'll be happier. A raised bed is fine too. Remember, sharp drainage. So aren't we fine gardeners? So we tell people, buy your poinsettias when they're done, throw them away. Buy your rosemary when they're done, throw them away. What else do we tell people? Same thing with paper whites. When they're done, throw them away. But don't throw them away. Put them on your compost pile. Sure. Put them on your compost pile. If they... If they do, if it is one that is, because some paper whites have, um, they are actually hardy here, some. Most are not. So there you go. Here's the thing. All that stuff is made in the greenhouse to be in the greenhouse. Can you overwinter a poinsettia? Yes, you can, but I, I just don't care enough. Put it in your compost pile, let it rot down, and then your compost pile will always contain the memories of Christmas past. Isn't that sweet? That's very sweet. You want to do the next quote? I do. A cottage will hold as much happiness as would stock a palace. Hamilton, right, maybe, again. I like this one. And this is, I'm sorry you didn't like the last one. I do my best. Um, This runs right into our books on the bookshelf because these two books, which talk about two different flowers, would be great for a cottage garden. They would, but the whole point of this is no matter how humble your home, there's probably more happiness in it than in a a big, fat palace. Right. So now we can talk about, we found two books. We did find two books. You read the first one because you, I don't have it. You do. Because I can't grow this plant. No. So I mentioned that I found a couple of snowdrops blooming, and normally they bloom late February, so I was really kind of surprised to see them. But given, the, as you said, the weird weather, I was not surprised. <laughs> but I, I bought a whole book on snowdrops by Gunter Waldorf. And we looked it up on Amazon, and it's a crazy high price, like $700 bazillion. Yeah, which is stupid, because then you looked it up on, was it books? What is that thing you like? Well, there's a thing called sellyourbooks.com, and they'll give you a price. They'll give you 48 cents for it. Okay, so, yeah, you can probably find it on Thrift Books or one of the other companies. So um, tell us about this book. So this book is, it's a, it's a little book. I mean, it's like uh, seven by seven. Yeah. And this is everything you ever wanted to know about snowdrops, including, you know, how we, we kind of laugh about the people that are enamored of snowdrops. Because the galanthophiles. The galanthophiles, because there's like, we just see those little white flowers, and they see differences between all of them. So we well, have to get on the ground and look up at them to even see the differences and be right. able to tell the difference, right? And we should, for our listeners who can't grow snowdrops like everybody south, um, they are two inches tall. They are the yeah. tiniest little flowers. Now, in mass, they look amazing. So what does uh, old Gunter say about snowdrops and telling the difference? Well, I don't know that he says a lot about it, but he's got he's got pictures of all of them. And it just rounding up pictures of all these different varieties, these different species, that was a Herculean effort for a very tiny flower. And a very tiny book. 
Yeah, well, the book isn't <laughs> tiny, tiny. It's how many pages is this sucker? Uh, this sucker is 150 plus pages. Okay, so here's, here's and mostly the thing. photographs. <laughs> yeah. So he has collections to visit, and of course, they are all in England because this guy is English. Okay, I'd say Gunter's German, but he lives in England for sure. They grow really well in England and Northeast. And we have a friend in Tennessee who grows them underneath a water faucet because they like moisture and cool temperatures. Well, here's the other thing. I bought, and they came back up. So a couple of years ago, I was speaking up in Michigan in the Detroit area, and this woman was selling, and it was uh, March. She was selling clumps of blooming snowdrops. And so I, oh, how nice. Yeah, they were very cute, and I had to buy them. And what they were doing was the Henry Ford Estate Mansion, whatever, they had planted like bazillions of them in the woods, and they were trying to remove them because they're not native. And so every spring, right. this woman and her coworkers or whatever, they would just dig up clumps of these and sell them because they wanted to get them out of really? the property. Yeah, because they're not native, and they were naturalizing because they liked it up there. Oh, okay. Well, I don't think they're that oppressive that they couldn't stay, but I'm not a total naturalist. I like both. Okay. That's kind of sad. So we also found another book because when people get enamored of a particular flower or plant, they tend to write a whole book about it. So that they do. You and I both have Hellebores, a comprehensive guide by C. Colston Burrell and Judith Knott Tyler. And this one. Uh -huh. This right here. This won an award. It won an award from the American Horticultural Society. Yeah, because it was heavily researched. And um, when I got into hellebores, I bought it years ago. Now, yes. there's been a lot of changes to hellebores in recent years. So this book will tell you a lot about the different seed strains out there that were out there at the time, but those seed strains have even changed from there. I think it's a great comprehensive history, though, of how hellebores got to the United States and how certain breeders became so enamored of them that they created these seed strains that are just amazing. David Culp is one of them, Brandywine mm -hmm. Cottage. Um, there's another person that that does a bunch up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, they've also shared seeds between different groups to try to make a better, hardier, bigger flower, sometimes the flowers to face you instead of looking down, spots. I mean, it's people here in certain parts of the U.S. are as crazy about hellebores as the, en the English are about snowdrops. They are, which reminds me. You hellebore, hellebore of files? <laughs> I just made that up. I don't know. <laughs> They're, they're hella gardeners. I don't know I don't what they know. are. Anyway, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say David Culp, he also is big into the snowdrops, isn't he? Because our friend Kathy has Purdy up in New York. Hasn't she gotten snowdrops from him? I don't know. I think he might be. He's into cottage gardening, and he has some wonderful books, too. In fact, he, he had one come out, I think, last year. But um, And he's a very nice guy, as is as is Cole Burrell. He's, he's really nice, too. I don't know Judith, not Tyler, but I want to say that she's a hellebore uh, breeder. But I could be wrong on that. Anyway, I just liked that book. It was really good. It helped me to understand hellebores and where they came from. And there are some that are vegetatively produced. But I always say go with a good seed strain. Because if you have a good seed strain that is from the south, it might be more heat tolerant. And you grow hellebores, of course, in the shade, just like you do snowdrops. So I looked it up while you were talking, and Judith, not Tyler, was did own a nursery down in Virginia, and they specialize in hellebores and other. I perennials. thought so. And her husband Richard took all the pictures for the book. Oh well, there you go. I'm glad you looked that up. But that was just what I remembered that she was. That's why she was an expert, and and so was Cole, and so they did it together, which is nice. I met him at a. Garden Com thing, and I know David Culp mostly online. I don't think I've ever met him. I've met him at a Garden Com. Oh, well, maybe I have too and don't remember because I'm <laughs> notorious. Carol's much better at people's names and remembering people. She has the mind of a steel trap. These, yeah. These is more like a, a sieve, you know? Things just well, run through it. 
Some people think my mind is closed like a steel trap, but we won't go well, there. Let's we won't talk go about, there. Let's talk about the dirt today. So the dirt for me was help a botanical garden. And I thought of it because this year I joined the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. No, I can't go visit it all the time. It's in Austin. I've been to it three times, but I can't visit all the time. I'm also a member of the Tulsa, um, the Tulsa Botanical Garden. And I just think that those is really important right now to help botanic gardens by joining a membership or giving a donation to them because they have really suffered this year. No visits. Yes, and I, I'm a member of the Indianapolis Zoo and White River Gardens, and I don't go there that often. I should because it's not that far away. Um, but I renew my membership because, you know, again, they had to shut down for so much time, and yeah, now all the visits are timed, and so, you know, they don't have people that are just spontaneously going because it's a great place to go and just walk around. Yeah, the Tulsa Botanic Garden's in the same shape. Um, in order to go visit their illuminations, which is their light show, you have to have a ticket ahead of time and a time and go in. And the day Bill and I went to visit when we were up in Tulsa recently, we didn't know that you needed a ticket, even though we're members. And um, we got, yeah. Anyway, we we got in. They let us in, but it was a little bit iffy. Also, we can't forget the American Horticultural Society. Um, they need help, too. They're not doing well. Right. They publish a magazine, American Gardener, which we always enjoy. A lot of good articles in those. Um, and it's really, they try to have a nice variety of articles. So no matter whether you're in the Pacific Northwest or down in Florida or Texas or Indiana or Oklahoma, you'll find something in there. Yeah, you will. And membership in the American Horticultural Society often gets you into other gardens for free, but I always make a donation because gardens are always running on very little money, even in a non-pandemic year. Right. That is true. It would make a great Christmas it gift would. for a gardening friend. So that's how we'll tie it yeah, in. Yeah, because they would get the gift and then they would get the magazine and remember their friend who gave them the gift. That's a great idea, Dee. And perhaps you could go there with your friend because outdoor stuff is less dangerous than indoor. True that. So let's talk about our garden commissions. You go first because I'm still trying to think of mine. Okay, I'm going to keep watering the plants in the greenhouse. Most of my um, little seedlings made it. I'm going to do a video in the greenhouse probably today or tomorrow. My baby granddaughter is coming over to visit today, so I'll do that first. Um also, water your indoor plants. I'm going to water my indoor plants once a week because of the indoor heat. It doesn't just dry out your skin. It dries out your plants, too. And um, you can buy a mister for some of your tropicals, but I haven't found it made that much of a difference to mine. If I just remember to water them really good, let them fully drain, and do that about once a week, they do just fine. So that's my garden commission. I mean, it's snowing. I can't. Too much else. So I just rem remembered my garden commission. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna carry over last week. Remember, I was all excited about terrariums. I'm still excited about terrariums, and I was gonna go around look at for all the containers, and I didn't somehow get that accomplished. So that's I'm that's okay. You can do that this week, and you're gonna get it done. I'm gonna go around and find all my containers that I could use for terrariums, so that I'm ready to go in January. Go go go! Because we're gonna. And you're also going to write your blog post for Garden Bloggers Blue. Yeah, Day. that's already so done. I. Oh, you're so good. You did say that in the beginning. That's all right. Rats. Well, in January. See, I told you, brains a sieve. Remember in January, we're going to do a Zoom recording of planting terrariums. Yes, it's already on our calendar as a floating thing. So, yes, we're going to get that done. Yeah, because I. Let's wrap up. Yeah. All right. Well, let me see. What's our wrap up? You want to do a wrap-up on NPR voices or just regular? Oh, try an NPR voice. Let's see what happens. I don't know if I can do this with a straight face. We'd don't like to look at me. We'd like to thank you for listening to The Garden Angelist. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. Also, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss anything. And if you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others. <laughs> yes. And be sure, be sure and check out. <laughs>
our show notes. Oh, Carol can't do it. Just say it normal. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you want to help support us, use the affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we earn a small commission and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the Garden Gate today. Bye until next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you.